Well, welcome to the Fox 10 YouTube channel. We're talking to Troy Hayden, a Fox 10 news anchor, about what was a pretty interesting experience yesterday. Your third time witnessing an execution. Right. But this probably one last. was, and probably the last, yeah. but this one was really unique for many reasons. Do you want to talk about one, why you've witnessed three, and how you got chosen to see this one? Uh, basically, it's a lottery uh, that they've put out for the media, and they'll, they'll ask who is interested in coming out and seeing this, and that's how you get chosen. So uh, that's basically how I was chosen. I got the, I knew this was coming up. I knew this was going to be an interesting execution uh, because they were changing the drug protocol. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're going from a three drug protocol, they went to a one drug, and now they're going to a two. And I knew they had some issues with it, so I thought it might be interesting to, to witness this and one. And it sure was. I mean, this one right. lasted about two hours. The two previous executions you witnessed lasted what? 10 minutes. Really? 15 tops, yeah. Uh, OK, so we're going to get into what's going through your mind when this is going on for hour and 40 minutes, two hours. But I first want to talk about yesterday morning you wake up and at the moment you're thinking the execution's on, you're driving down to Florence, kind of what's going through your mind? It was very early morning because I worked until, you know, with you, I, I was on until 10.30 at night and then uh, I get to bed about midnight. And so uh, I had to get up around, I think it was about six I got up, took a shower, drove down. So I'm a little fuzzy, just trying to get my wits about me as I drive down. Um, I'm just preparing myself, getting ready, thinking about, um, what my workload is going to be for the day. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go into any story, it's not so much, you know, living that whole experience, it's how I'm going to take that experience and communicate it to the viewers. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking about on the drive down. And I know in the days preceding this, you were talking about the crime that happened. I'm right. sure that you were weighing that in your head a little bit. That, that I know that came up for you throughout the week. You're thinking about what this guy did, why he's sitting on death row. Right, you know, and, and you know, as we continue talking here, this is not, this is Joe Wood behind us, and the guy who was executed yesterday, and this isn't about Joe Wood so much mm -hmm. to me. This, to me, this is more about the process of what all of us, what you did yesterday, what I did, what everybody in Arizona did, because we're all involved in this, and how that process, uh, you know, played out yesterday. So, Joe Wood, um, not a good guy, terrible crime, tore a family apart 25 years ago. That's mm -hmm. part of the process as well that people have a problem with. It's like, why does it take 25 years for us to finally get to the point where he faces the ultimate punishment? So mm -hmm. I wasn't even thinking about Joe Wood so much. And, uh, and I was thinking about this family and how they were going to react and how they were going to see it. But, you know, you're talking about being removed a quarter century from this actually happening. Right. But, you know, there's one thing that I will say is whenever you see, maybe it's just a feeling I get, but as soon as that family walked through the door, I knew exactly who they were mm. because People who have lost somebody to a violent crime get that kind of a hollow, almost a shattered look, you know, and I can just yeah. see it on their faces. So 25 I really years happened. later, it's still, there's oh, yeah. something it's missing inside father of and a daughter, yeah. you know, so it was, the, it was the, another daughter and who was the sister mm -hmm. of the people who were killed. So, so you're driving up to a uh, maximum security prison yesterday. They, I'm sure they let you on through and then kind of walk us through driving in to getting to basically the death chamber, which not yeah. many people have seen. No, no, and it's not a nice place, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they lock Florence down, especially around, this is happened down in Florence, which is about an hour southeast of the valley, and uh, it's the old prison. I don't know when exactly it was built, I think right around the turn of the century, so it looks like an old prison, this big concrete walls. And uh, there's a checkpoint at the main intersection outside, then there's another checkpoint right at the main entrance when you go inside, and at that point I had to identify myself. I drove in to where the other media was assembled. Um, we met up with the communications uh, director for Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. and he brought us inside a uh, building, and basically that's just like a classroom. That's not actually inside the prison. That's just, just outside the gates. And before we were even allowed to get on the van to go into that area, we got searched. Uh, we had to have um, the only thing that we could have with us, we could bring our wallet, we could bring our key for our car and, uh, and your watch, but everything else had to go. You couldn't what bring do you a mean? Pen. You just leave it there? I left it in my car in the parking lot. So before you even get on the van to go, they, they wand you and they say, okay, that's your watch, that's okay. And they say, okay, that's your key, that's okay, you can have that. But you can't have a pen, you can't bring a phone. Whoa, you know, so it's you know. all memory. You, no. Obviously there's no live tweets, you oh, no, can't record yeah, anything, you can't anything nothing. Like that. But they give you a little tiny pad and a pencil. And then they collected that at the end of the execution, which I thought was odd. But they give you a little pad and a pencil, and that's what you can bring in to take notes. Okay, so uh, you get back there. Yeah, and so you're in that first room, and uh, the uh, Department of Corrections Director, Charles Ryan, came in and spoke to us and said, okay, here's where we are. Um, everything's going the way it should be going. 
at 10 a.m. Now, we got a little bit of a delay yesterday, but this mm -hmm. is how he first came in. He said, at 10 a.m., we're going to move forward. We're going to move you in, and that's it. He kind of walks out, and he's gone. Yeah. So we then move inside the prison itself, and we walked about, I don't know, about 50 yards to the prison entrance, and at that point is when the big iron gates open up, you know, that you see like in the movies, right. big gates. And only one opens at a time. It's a long hallway. There's gates on both sides. So one opens, you walk in, that closes, then the other one will open up. And so we went in front of another guard and we were escorted by our liaison inside the prison to another like classroom type area. I think it's where the corrections officers uh, either you know, have some sort of classroom activity or something, but it's inside the prison gate. And so we sat there and waited until we were taken back to the death house. That is a str and it was hours that you waited there. Right. I mean, I just can't imagine you're sitting in this maximum security prison about to witness what we think, because at this point there were appeals that were still kind of right. playing out, an execution. Um, right. you get in a, do you have a, a pit of horrible feeling in your stomach? No. How do you feel? You know, the thing is, and people ask me that all the time, is how can you handle this and how can you see it? You know, I've, I've been in TV news for so long now. It's been like 26, 27 years. And my, my second day as an intern, like the very first time I ever was a part of a newsroom, I saw the most horrific scene. It was an accident scene. And that really affected me. And I think over the years, you get a little bit of a tolerance for it. I don't mm -hmm. want to say I'm inhuman, but you, you, you figure out a way to kind of deal with that. So I wouldn't say I was upset thinking about watching somebody die. Uh, again, I was more thinking about the coverage that I was going to provide later right. on. The odd thing is you're thrown into an area with five other people that you really don't know very well as other mm -hmm. members of the media and your liaison, and there's, you're, there's nothing to do. There's no phone to look at. So you end up making <laughs> conversation. You know, it's interesting. You make conversation about different things. You yeah. talk about other executions, you talk about other stories you're working on, things like that. So that's what you do. The like the, the old time. days before yeah, really. we spent talking. Our, all of our time uh, on our phones. <laughs> Imagine talking. So um, at what point do the families come in? No, we, well, we don't see them at all. Let, let me, do um, you want to go chronologically because then I can talk about us. Yeah. I, I don't see the family until I get in the death house. Okay. So let, let's talk about how eventually you get into the, to the death okay. house. Okay. So uh, the, um, the liaison we're with, and now I'm fast forwarding because we were taken out of the prison and then brought back in. So this is like when it was actually going to happen. Yeah. So this is later in the afternoon, about 1.30. Because there were some delays with some last minute yeah, uh, legal the, the, wranglings the, and things uh, like that. The state Supreme Court took a look at it, but then went back. And so at 1 o'clock, we met in that outside classroom and at 1.30 we were in the inside classroom okay. ready to go. And that is when you knew there will be an execution today. Yeah, it was, it was gonna happen. So at that point he had no more appeals or anything else. So we, our liaison, he's got a little um, earpiece in his ear and we saw him kind of talking to whatever he was talking to. Okay, yeah, okay, we're ready, okay. And then he took us and this I think is maybe one of the most intense parts of uh, the three executions that I've witnessed. The first one was back when it was midnight, because we used to mm -hmm. execute people right at midnight. This is 1995, I think is the first one I saw. And you're walking through this big open prison yard. And this is an old prison. So like you see in the movies where you walk and there's a yard and there's a big building and a big building and a big mm -hmm. building. And it's on lockdown. And it's dead silent. I mean, there's thousands mm -hmm. of people in there, but it's silent. And you look up, this is back with the midnight, and I could just see the outlines of the heads of the other inmates looking down on us as we walk through that courtyard. And it's silent except for the clicking of our heels. Ooh, I just got chills, Oh, Troy. I'm telling you, it's, it's a very, very intense walk back to this death house. And it's all the way on the other end from where the entrance is. So you're walking all the way through past these big buildings. The death house itself is very small. It's about the size of a half of a double wide trailer, very small. And the death house consists of a small cell where the condemned is held, the room where he'll be put to death, at our, at our waiting room. And so we walked into it, um, again, very cramped, about 25 people in there. We sit on benches. Mm -hmm. And it was so close that the person sitting next to me, we were touching shoulders while we were in there. And, and this was the, the, uh, a previous execution? And this is yesterday or oh, whatever. Yesterday. Yeah. Oh, okay. let's, let's, let's fast forward to yesterday since everybody's talking about that today. But it was very similar in the previous two executions, but same place. So we sat down on these little benches, touching shoulders. Directly behind us, as you turn around and look, you can see the outline uh, of the gas chamber. It's still there. The gas chamber is directly behind wow. you. So as you sit, you can almost reach back and touch it. That's how small the room is. And it's got little blinds on it. And then a big chimney that shoots out of there that would vent the gas. Right. Mm -hmm. So nobody else would get you know, sick or killed because of the gas. And then directly in front of us is a big, like a picture window, rectangular, with a curtain drawn on it. Yeah, and I think we've seen this video. We've yes. shown some of this video. And you see the basically the gurney, the bed that the... Right. Uh, that the convict will lay down on. Yeah, what was on. And, um, but what was new this last time is they had two monitors, probably like 
25 inch or 27 inch TV monitors on either side because those were clicked on as soon as we got in there and we saw Wood laying on the table with his arms exposed. So now, as part of the process of a witness, you watch the IVs actually go into his arms. Interesting. And now, that why, never why did before. they not show that before? Is there I'm a, not quite they sure. Didn't, you, you don't see who's putting the, the uh, IVs in? You see them, but they're wearing eye protection and a mask. So you could ne never identify the executioner no. of this? No. That's by state law. Mm -hmm. You can't identify the executioner. And, so uh, is it one person? Are there two people? There are two, there guards in there? Yes. Uh, yes, to all three. There were, there were two people, um, medical personnel, putting the IVs in. The, uh, there was a corrections officer in there with them. I believe at one point there were two corrections officers, and then at one point the warden is also in there. We obviously don't <clears> know <throat> the identity of the executioner, but do we know if that is the only role they play in the uh, Department of Corrections? Uh, we don't do know they, much about them. We just don't uh, know. The only thing they really release are their, their, in a very general way, their credentials. You know, what they, right. how, how come they're qualified to do this? That's about it. Okay. You know? So, um, so the, the TV, we see him put the, um, the IVs in and he's laying there and he's kind of looking around and then the TVs go off, the curtain opens and there he is, he's right there. Mm -hmm. And he was wearing in that same kind of orange jumpsuit you see him in there. Uh, short sleeves and the tops of the sleeves, which I thought was interesting, I'd never seen before, were Velcro. So they could open them up and get to his arms really easily. So it was a special suit made. Okay. So the IV this. is up here in the top of the No, the or? IV was down here, but he was wearing short sleeves and they were Velcro. So I think so they could slide up they had a um, blood pressure. Oh, okay. To determine of. his uh, vital statistic, you know, probably his vitals. Probably, and also to pump up and get the veins <laughs> right. correct, you know. Um, why, now, why would they show the IV going in on uh, television screens and not just open the, uh, the, the drapes, basically, and let you see it live? I don't know. Right there. That's another good question. I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I was surprised that we had the TV screens. I'd never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you assume they're recording all of this because they want to know that they did it right. And in case anything goes wrong, they want to be able to have a record of what right. happened. Uh, and you also maybe get a better view. I mean, the fact that you're looking at a camera looking straight down on them, seeing everything happen is probably better than mm. seeing something like that happen from you know, three or four feet away. A lot of people who follow the death penalty and, and things that, that go along with it um, are very much aware of a new drug protocol. But other people say, wait, why did it take two hours as opposed to 10 minutes? Why is there a all of this hoopla surrounding the new drugs. Why are they switching the drugs around? Yes, can you talk a little bit yeah. about that before <clears throat> we know, get into the final for, moments? For years and years, there was a three drug protocol. Mm -hmm. And so what they would do is they'd use, I believe it was a barbiturate to put you out. Then there was another drug that went in that stopped your lungs. And the last drug that went in stopped your heart. They're called paralytics. Mm -hmm. They basically make you paralyzed. So the whole process was pretty fast. You stop somebody's lungs and heart for 10 minutes, all the tissues are dying right. and it's over, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the people who made those drugs, they weren't made to kill people. They're made to help people in different ways, different uses. Right. So the manufacturers, right? So the manufacturers started saying, "Hey, wait a second, you know," uh, and they were being uh, people were protesting them and things. And they said, "Look, we we don't necessarily want our product to be used to kill people mm -hmm. anymore. We don't want that." So they stopped. And I'm providing sure there it. was some public pressure as well. You bet. It's like, okay, whatever the drug company that makes it. Um, people who, who oppose the death penalty right. were putting pressure right. on them you as know, well. You know, boycott so-and-so because their drug's being used to put people down. Right, and they're selling it to Department of Corrections right. around the country. So that stopped. Then they went to a single drug protocol. They went mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, that was also very effective. I think it was like a massive dose of barbiturates. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it was. It was a massive dose, and that worked well. But then the same thing happened. That company said, I no longer, it was, I think it was called thiopental. That, that company said, I no longer want my drug to be used for this purpose. So right. now all of a sudden, the Department of Corrections is saying, and not just ours, but all over the country, what, okay, what do we use? And how do you experiment on drugs you know, that'll kill people? Who's yeah. gonna volunteer for that? Right, we wanna right? know that whatever we use is effective. Right. It's um, relatively quick, but more importantly, not painful, because right. that's kind of how it's, a, uh, that's the, the law. law's written. The it, law's written. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you. I know Some I've, people would like to see it painful. A, a lot of right. people would like to see. They're, they're saying, why should he have a, a, a non-painful death right. because he inflicted so much pain? Right. But because the law is, that's can't the law. be cruel. I mean, I, I, I totally understand. Like this family yesterday, I felt for them so much. I mean, they, they wanted this guy to suffer as much as he could. I'm not saying he suffered yesterday. Let me interrupt you for a second. We're showing, is this the room that you were looking at? Yeah, into? but they've, they've, uh, changed, they've it a changed it a little bit. They put like some, I thought it was really interesting. They put like blue swatches of fabric on the back 
And I thought that was wow. odd. It was Let's like keep this rolling if we can um, to our producers. So it looks, uh, one of the shots we showed, it looked very, like, kind of dark and ominous in there. Is this pretty much the lighting? Yeah, that looks right? about like the writing. So okay. the, the, the um, window we were looking through is the one on the left. Okay. And the window on the right is where, I assume, I don't know, 100%, but the doctors or the medical the personnel. The warden or something, yeah. No, the warden was actually standing in the room. So he'd be over here on the foot, okay. uh, on this side, on the foot of the... Uh, of the bed. Uh, the, yeah, the, the um, table there. And it's so tiny. It's such a small room. And yeah, and the room we're sitting in is not much larger. Right. So the right, right behind that window, but it's kind of tiered. It's, there's okay. a lower level, then a little bit higher, then a little bit higher. So people used to stand, and they just put the benches in as well. So well, Especially yesterday, lasting two hours, you were probably very happy there were some benches in there. Okay, so they, they've got the IV in um, Joseph Wood's arm. They, do you see them injecting no. drugs? No, that's never seen. No. When do you realize that, okay, the process is starting? He is starting to fell asleep. Die. So he was looking around, and I've always said to people, um, they've all said, well, what, you know, is it awful watching these guys die? And I say, you know, I, I, it really doesn't bother me all that much. I hate to say that. It, it doesn't. It's, it's not a pleasant sight, but I'm not, like, having nightmares about it. Mm -hmm. But the one tough part that I've always found is when they look at you in your eyes. And, that, and it's like, you know, so here's this guy who's killed people, and now he's about ready to be killed, and he knows he's going to be dead in two minutes. He's looking right in your face and it's just a weird you know directly in your eyes oh yeah because it's and was he doing this looking around the room he can see all of you and he's yeah, looking he, it's just like he picked out four or five of us and he was really kind of you know i don't let's say giving an evil eye or whatever mm -hmm. but looking right at us and that was and i was one of them so it's weird he kept looking at me and i, was, and, I almost and, wanted to and what, it, what would you kind of um assess his emotion was was he just looking at you like hey i think i know that guy or was it more of i don't know I can't believe this is my, uh, my last no, moment. No, he didn't look scared at all. I mean, the, the last two guys, I have to admit, they looked terrified. This guy didn't. This guy was just kind of, he was almost, like I said, almost giving you an evil eye. It was, really? It was, yeah, that was creepy. That was the one, that was the, that was the weirdest part of the whole process for me. Interesting. Just looking at him. Uh, and the family, I think, said something about how he, he sneered mm -hmm. at them or smiled at them. Yeah, did you he, notice he that? said he smiled and laughed at them. I never saw a laugh. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Um, and I know that family went through so much, and they were sitting right next to me. And what I will, I mean, I'll never forget the intensity of that family either. I mean, we were in there, not to skip forward, but we were in there for a long time. They never averted their eyes. They kept their eyes directly on him. Mm -hmm. The entire, I mean, every time I would look over, it wasn't like they were shuffling. I mean, they were just... That Staring. family's been through so much. Yeah, and and for them, this is at the end of a really awful cha a twenty five year chapter for that family. Yeah. Having to see him in court, you know, over and over and right. over again, and probably and testifying over and over and over again, and looking right. at the pictures of their loved ones who aren't there anymore. I can't even imagine. So um, he he falls asleep basically, yeah. and. Um, when did you, you thought 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe max, half an hour? No, I was thinking 10 minutes. Any of the other two executions I saw were about 10 minutes. When did you start to kind of look around and go, this is, is this how it's supposed to go? I mean, nobody in there had seen a, a two hour execution before. I'm not sure who's ever seen a two hour lethal injection execution. I don't yeah. know if one's ever happened. But no, I mean, he, he laid there and he was asleep and I'm thinking, okay, well, this is just like the other ones I've seen and they're gonna come in in 10 minutes and it's gonna be over. That's not what happened. He started kind of gulping for air. His mouth started opening and closing. Mm -hmm. And that was going on. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, and we're looking at the, some yeah. of the crime scene here. There's a, it was an auto body shop. And this is the scene 25 years in ago down in Tucson, uh, when yeah. he gunned down his ex-girlfriend and her father. Right. And of course, we're back in the uh, executioner's room there. Right. And that's, that's yeah. The, the curtain now is on the inside. Uh, the, the curtain's not on the outside. It's on the inside of that room. Okay. Um, so... Uh, I forgot where I was. We were talking about it, it going on so long and nobody had ever seen a oh, two yeah. hour execution. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of gulping for air and, um, and I thought to my, after about 15 minutes, I thought to myself, well, this is, this is not, you know, this is ugly, but execution is not pretty and that's whatever, right. he's, he'll, he'll be done soon. And then it goes into half an hour and then it goes into 45 minutes, then it goes into an hour. So think about, you know, I, I said like watching like two full episodes of Seinfeld or watching the whole Fox 10 News at 9. And the whole thing, that whole hour, you're just staring at a guy doing that gulping I was telling you about. Yeah, and it, and it wasn't happening. And at that point, everybody's kind of looking around saying, what, what happened? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. You know, has something gone wrong? Uh, his attorneys jumped up and ran out of the death house. And we found out later they went to federal court trying to get it stopped in the middle of the execution. Right. They to wanted it. him to be resuscitated and life-saving 
measures taken, yeah. which would know. have been the uh, never unheard of probably. I've never in, heard of anybody doing in that. execution. Obviously, in, that didn't work. No, it, well, and it didn't ever happen. It mm -hmm. never. Oh, you're talking about their court. Yeah, yeah, yeah they never got it. And um, and then an hour and 15 minutes is still a thing. An hour and a half. And I remember at an hour and a half, I wrote a note down in my little notebook. But I remember thinking to myself, what happens if they can't kill this guy? I mean. Are we at the point where they, they can't do it? I mean, I, I'm thinking after an hour yeah. and a half, whatever drugs they pumped into them, they've got to be pumping more or whatever, and it's, nothing's going on. And it almost appeared at the very end, and uh, probably just my mind's eye tricking me, but it appeared like his chest was rising and falling, like he was getting more breath than he was mm -hmm. at the very beginning. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, what, what's happening? But about 10 minutes later, it was, he stopped doing it, and it was finally, it was over mm -hmm. at that point. And then uh, what? They, they close the curtains right away? Then the uh, Department of Corrections uh, head, um, Ryan, came in again and said um, the inmate is deceased, time of death, whatever it was, I forget what it was, 2.57 or uh, three, it was later. Any tears, any uh, cheers, any, any uh, outbursts no. from nobody? The, uh, the only time I saw the younger sister, the family member, um, tear up was when the death warrant was read. And when the death warrant was read by the warden, they mentioned the names of the victims. Oh. And at that point, she teared up a little bit. Right. But from then on, no, they were... And you heard from their comments yesterday. I mean, if anybody out there heard their comments, it was, you know... Emotional, they were still, raw. Oh, and they're, they're just, they're shattered. They're just what they've been through. And yeah. it's finally over. And, and they were frustrated that the attention of this execution was going on what happened to him yeah. and not going on, which is totally understandable. I get well, that. it's taken on a couple of stories. Uh, obviously, the first story is the terrible crime he committed, then that he's on death row. But the whole drug protocol is a separate story that is kind of being debated in this country. Um, and and it's a, there's a conundrum because states that execute prisoners don't know what to do and they're trying to figure it out right. so they're in this process of figuring it out and and it's really two separate stories but as a family member who's lost somebody I can see exactly where they were coming from oh, yeah. they're hearing this conversation about drug protocols and did it work did it work effectively is this how it was supposed to go and they're and they're thinking who cares he's dead that's right. all that matters in, in their opinion it took way too long and they probably would like to have had him suffer more. Of course, that's not the way we do things in this country with no, the death penalty. I mean, and that's... But you, know, you that's see where a, they're coming yeah, from. Yeah, I'm sorry they got caught up in this particular execution. I mean, I feel terrible for them that they got caught up. If, if this execution had been no problems whatsoever, exactly as we thought, there would have been, I think, way more focus on the family and what they went through. Right. There would have been no focus on this protocol or no focus on this guy at all. But um, like you said, there's two different stories. So mm -hmm. the fact that this didn't go well and the fact that it's coming off two other lethal injection executions that also didn't go as planned, it's part of this, this broadening debate. Right. And they got caught up in it. And, and it will probably be figured out. It might take some time. It might take some time. Uh, after the inmate is deceased, um, they lead you out and you go to, to speak to the cameras right away? Yeah. So... Um, when that's done, uh, the, the first group of people who leave are the family members. I didn't go through that. I probably should have. They bring us all in in different groups. That's why I never see the family before we get in the death house. Right. So the very first group that goes in is um, his, the Woods, at, in this case, his attorneys and any family member that he has. He and didn't have no any family, family member showed no. up? No. He just had uh, three attorneys and a deacon show okay. up for him. Then the media, then state officials, the Florence police chief was there and some other officials who I didn't, a couple mm -hmm. of them I recognized and a couple of them I didn't know who they were. And then finally the family came in after them. So you all leave in that reverse order. Right. So the family left first, then we're all standing there, then the state officials left, and then we left. So when we walked out, we walked straight through the prison gates that we came in on. Um, he had very long last words. So we all got together with our notepads and figured out, got the last words down, because I guess that's important. And it, it came, to, the, the DOC spokesperson got exactly what his last words were. We decided, okay, that this is what it was. And then we walked out and then and we walked into that very first classroom we were in and the assorted media was already set mm -hmm. up and ready there. And that's where you make a statement and, yes. and then, did it ever cross, I mean, this is kind of how I was thinking as this was going on. I'm sitting at my desk in the newsroom. We know the execution's underway and I'm thinking, did this guy, when he chose to take a couple of lives, ever think beyond that moment, of the repercussions of that. Yeah. 
Probably you know, not. Right. If he if he did, I, he wouldn't have pulled that trigger. And yeah. You know, it was a stupid, it was a stupid, ugly, senseless crime. And you know, we've been in this business long enough. I'd say 95% of the crimes we see are exactly that, just stupid, senseless, and then, but they have huge impacts. Mm -hmm. and, and this guy, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know a lot about this guy, but you know, it was 25 years ago, he's had all that time to think about it, and then he gets killed. Yeah, if, and I think if you would have asked him, would you have done this over again, of course he would have said yeah, yes. No. But it, it didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. He made that stupid decision to go over there and kill those people, that evil decision he made. Mm -hmm. And that led to this. Well, Troy Hayden, uh, one of the few witnesses to the execution that, uh, that has made news really around the world for, for reasons other than just a, a prisoner was executed, right. but now it brings up in the debate of how do we go about doing this in the future? And was it really effective? And should we continue with this protocol? We appreciate your insight. I feel as if I were there. <laughs> Can I add one more thing? Yeah. I, I, I get the question a lot. Why, why have you been to three of these things? Why, why do you do that? So I want to explain that because I think that's a valid question. The, the very first one I went to was when I was a young reporter back in 1995. I think I said that mm -hmm. earlier. And that was just straight luck of the draw. It just came up and somebody said, would you be willing to do this? I said, yes. I thought it would be good to do this. Uh, the second one uh, was um, a, the very first change in this drug protocol. And it became a big deal and part of this debate. It was in 2010, so it was 15 years after the first one. And uh, Jeffrey Landrigan was his name. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about these different drugs. And there was a question about whether or not the drugs came from overseas. And it was kind of a big right. deal. So I was asked if I wanted to do that one. I said yes. Because again, it was another kind of landmark case. And yeah. I could tell we were And that took how long? Th th those drugs were the same drugs they were using before but where they got the drugs. At that point, they were just running out, and it turns out, uh, I believe it's been proven at this point, but it was alleged that uh, the Department of Corrections got them from overseas, because uh -huh. we couldn't get them here anymore. Okay. And so that apparently was a big deal at that, at that time. And so, again, this drug protocol had changed. I knew, heading into this, that we were dealing with something else, and so I wanted to see this one again and be part of this. And as a anchor reporter, and if you watch any of the stuff I do, you know that I like to get out and experience things firsthand. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's the best way for me to be able to communicate to viewers what happens inside of these things, whether mm -hmm. it's a breaking new situation. So any execution going forward, I can say to viewers, okay, here's what happens, and let me right. take you through this. Because you've, you've been there. You've been there. I've been there. So you think you'll do another one? No, I think I, I think I mean, I'm if they good. completely were to change the protocol, would you sign up to yeah. maybe? Another lethal injection? I don't, I don't know. I mean, if they went back to, I mean, some federal judge says go to firing squad, yeah. and I'm laughing about it, but, you know, I mean, a lot of people are, I put it on my Facebook page, and people are going crazy. They're saying, yes, go, go do it. I mean, give yeah. Pete, I will maybe give, give the option, because maybe somebody would prefer that as a, as a way to go. Uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I said, as I said, I feel like I was there after oh, listening to your description, and... Um, we appreciate all, all of your time. Awesome. I know it was a long day for you and a long day for everybody down there. Yeah. And thanks for joining us on the Fox 10 YouTube channel.